Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module that's part of the WITS RHI catch-up sessions. This particular session will be on our complicated TB cases, and this is the first case which is to do with TB drug reactions um, in patients. So our case is a 42-year-old female who's been referred from a private physician. She's newly diagnosed with HIV with a high CD4 count of 568. She's been well controlled with epilepsy on carbamazepine slow release for the last 12 years. She's presented with a, to the physician a month earlier complaining of malaise, weight loss and a chronic headache. Our patient was diagnosed with TB meningitis two weeks ago and started on regimen one of antituberculosis chemotherapy. But now she's presenting of feeling very nauseous, she has a fever and she has a pruritic skin rash. Blood results shows a normal creatinine, a low white cell count, normal hemoglobin. So let us briefly look at a few slides of rashes that makes us very suspicious that it's due to a drug reaction. The most typical rash we usually see is what we call the maculopapular rash. So that is when you have almost a red, red spots on the skin, but also actual papules that you can feel above the surface of the skin. Here's another example of such a maculopapular rash. So if you run your fingers over the skin, you would actually feel the little bumps. Another example of a drug rash, which is almost more papular and nodular in places, and tend to be generalized um, over the trunk, for example, or over the arms and legs. Now, there's not many rashes that actually um, affects the palms of the hands, and drug rashes is known to do that. The other rash that obviously affects the palms of the hand is secondary syphilis. This is now when we start becoming quite worried about the drug rash, where it starts to have mucosal involvement, such as blisters, as we can see here. And here's another example of some very worrying drug reactions. Um, on the top left-hand corner there, that is the... Um, conjunctiva that we're looking at with actual um, ulceration on the conjunctiva. You can see also ulceration there on the mouth or blisters on the skin. Um, but in the left bottom corner there, we call those target lesions. And they literally look like round lesions with a, with a target in the middle. Um, and these are all rashes that causes us concern if they are, are caused by medication. Another feature of a rash that would make um, be concerning is what we call non-blanching rashes. And you can see they almost look like bruises. And if you were to run your finger over them quite hard, you're actually unable to push the color of it away. So some people do um, what they call the glass test, where if you put a glass onto the rash, you could look through the bottom of the glass. And if you were to press down, the, the, the rash will not go paler, a non-blanching rash. Um, and here's another example, and they almost look like bruising on the skin and is also a sign um, that we would need to stop the treatment that is causing that particular rash. So here's a little summary of what you want to think of, because we often see rashes um, on medication, and we have to make a decision on whether we are going to stop the treatment or whether we're going to treat through the rash. Um, and there's a few major red flags. First red flag I want to highlight there is any burning um, or pain of the lesion. Um, usually the lesions might itch or they might not have any sensation at all. Your second red flag there is any mucosal involvement. So we showed pictures of those with blisters on the mucosa or those target lesions um, that are also highlighted. We also mentioned non-blanching lesions, which are also the kinds of lesions we see with meningococcal septicemias. Blurred vision is actually caused by the conjunctiva being involved, um, similar to the mucosa. And then any fever or systemic symptoms. So if you have a patient coming in with a rash and they're quite ill, all of those would be the kind of danger signs that would actually uh, mean that we have to stop the treatment that the patient is taking. So let's talk a little bit specifically around um, TB drugs. And there's very specific guidelines in the, TB, in the national TB guidelines on how we manage the drugs caused by the TB drugs. And all of the TB drugs can cause the rash. And it all depends on the severity. So mild itching rashes are common. And we normally try and treat through them if there's none of those red flags. You can give an antihistamine. Um, one can use prednisone. Generally, this is not a good idea. 
in our HIV positive patients um, as it can complicate um, the picture. But a topical cream can be used and certainly some, some aqueous cream. One of the rashes we need to know about specifically, although it's quite rare, is a petechial rash due to rifampicin um, that has caused a thrombocytopenia. So it might be sensible, if you're not sure, just to do a platelet count, um, and it might be that that's been caused by your rifampicin. But if you have any red rash that is accompanied with a fever or systemic symptoms or any of those red flags we mentioned earlier, then it's very important to stop all the drugs. Um, fortunately, we don't see anaphylaxis very frequently, but that obviously needs to be managed. Um, if you have a patient that's got quite severe TB, you might have to put another regimen together that is not caused, that is not in their current first line regimen, and while you wait for the rash to, to settle down. And that can be quite difficult. Our options are, for example, our mycins, amikacin, canamycin, streptomycin which we might have to combine with drugs like ofloxacin or levofloxacin and cyclosurine. So a lot of these drugs are within our MDR-TB regimens, and I would certainly discuss these patients before you design a regimen for them. In general, if the patient's not very ill, we'll stop all the drugs, we'll wait for the rash to improve, and then we can actually reintroduce the drugs one by one to try and figure out which drug is the one causing the trouble. Um, and we'll obviously monitor it every step to see if there's any signs and symptoms of the rash returning. The order in which you um, introduce them has to do not only with how likely they are to cause the rash, but also how important they are within the regimen. So you can see there where you tend to start with rifampicin first, then isoniazide, then PZA, and lastly, ethambutol. Not because ethambutol is necessarily the biggest cause for the rash, but because it's the least important um, within the TB regimen. So if there's recurrence of a rash, then you're going to stop that last introduced drug and you will continue then with the, the next drug after that. And there's specific regimens you will use depending on which drug is causing the trouble. So if you can't use any rifampicin, then you can see there, um, there are specific regimens recommended. So you will have two months then of your um, INH, your ethambutol combined with moxifloxacin um, plus or minus one of your streptomycin, amicacin, or canamycin. And then there's a very, very long um, continuation phase of 16 months of combining INH, ethambutol, and moxifloxacin. And similarly, there's specific regimens if you can't use INH or if you can't use pyrazinamide, and you will look those up in those particular scenarios. One last note on this particular case is, as they mentioned, the patient, when she was diagnosed with HIV, was a well-known epileptic already needing, taking carbamazepine. Um, but remember, we can't use carbamazepine in patients on ARVs. As a matter of fact, most of our anti-epileptics are a challenge due to the drug interactions with efavirenz, and they both affect each other. You can have more breakthrough fits on the one side as well as virological failure on the other side. The only two drugs we have that are safe to use are sodium valproate, our epilim, which is our first choice um, and easily available in the public sector. But also be aware of lamotrigine, um, very important in our patients who are wanting to fall pregnant or might have already fallen pregnant. Remember, sodium valproate is very teratogenic. Um, but you can also use lamotrigine if you've got somebody who's on sodium valproate and is getting breakthrough fits and you want to add in a second drug. Um, and we don't have many other options for patients on ARVs. The switch has to happen very slowly over four weeks. And so generally, if you diagnose somebody with HIV who's already on a drug like carbamazepine or phenytoin, you need to make it a priority to slowly get that switch happening um, so that the patient is already on an appropriate drug by the time you start your ARVs. So thank you very much, a short, short and sweet case. Um, thank you to Vids RHI for this great case study and to our funders. Do see our next e-learning module on a case study regarding liver injury um, and TB drugs.